Are you sure your husband's dead? Why, yes. There seems to be a trace of uncertainty in that yes. You know, uh, a yes like that was once responsible for me jumping out of a window. And I'm not the jumper I used to be. Welcome to the Marx Brothers Council Podcast, episode 21, No Snow and No Ice. And yes, you heard me right, the podcast is 21 Today, which means that it's at last old enough to order a drink at an American bar. So if we sound even less coherent than usual, you'll know the reason why. For this edition, we're going back to what many of us quite erroneously tend to think of as the beginning of the story, the 1929 movie, The Coconuts. For the brothers themselves, of course, it was merely the latest turning in what had already been a long and winding career, and they probably had no notion whatever that they were only now embarking on the chapter of their lives that would ensure we're still here talking about them nearly a century after it was made and many decades after their deaths. As humorist obsessives know, it wasn't even their first movie, merely their first talkie and the first of their films known to have survived. Leslie Halliwell called it probably the earliest all-talking film that can still be revived without too much audience discomfort. And it's probably fair to say that it enjoys no really secure position within the brothers' cinematic canon. For many reasons, most of them technical, it's generally fenced off as an apprentice work, usually ranked at the bottom of their paramount achievements, or even, by fans as numerous as they are insane, right down with the lesser MGMs. Advocates of the film, such as myself, however, tend to foam with passion on the subject. I place it at number two in their work, close behind Animal Crackers, and I'm predicting that you may find my co-hosts too are more warmly disposed to it than the average. And speaking of co-hosts, here they are, blown up from 16mm dupes and walking on from the left before a crudely fixed camera. First, a man who knows better than most that The Coconuts is not the beginning of the story, as he proved by reviving their previous Broadway smash, I'll Say She Is, to rave reviews and contented coconuts. Please switch your phone to silent and refrain from using flash photography for Mr. Noah Diamond. <laughs> Do you mean to tell me that Polly is going to marry Harvey Yates? <laughs> and with him, brandishing his scissors and clutching his stopwatch, the man who not only hosts the show, but also ensures that it's neat and tidy and runs on time. A bit like an Italian fascist train. Your favourite Italian fascist, Mr. Bob Gassell. <laughs> yes, my name is Bob, but you could call me Belbo. And I just recently became Italian, actually. <laughs> but you've always been a fascist. Well, I'm not registered as one. <laughs> so... The Coconuts. I've never seen it. Is it any good? <laughs> I've seen it three times uh, in the last uh, three weeks uh, preparing for this podcast, which has taken us numerous times to get started. And each time my uh, feeling about it has changed. So you're getting today's version. And has it, has it generally got better or got worse or not? Has it not it's gotten, changed in that it's sort gotten of higher. Uh, to be honest, I've had a lot of issues over the years sitting through the whole film because of technical issues and pacing. But uh, I was able to see through all that and really appreciate the great writing and humor here. Uh, you know, I, maybe it's not the film for every Marx fan. My teenage daughter, who had enjoyed Duck Soup and Night at the Opera, she had a tough time with it. And I understand that. But for a real hardcore Marx fan and somebody maybe who's a little more savvy with the uh, time period and the context of when it was made. It's really, it's really a wonderful film. Uh, just as a prelude, you know, my, my feelings too have um, definitely uh, improved over the years. And I've gone um, over the course of my adult life from appreciating it, but ranking it fairly low for the usual reasons. And then it has steadily risen in my estimation. I do think that this is the Marx Brothers film that benefits most from the beautiful restorations performed for the recent Blu-rays. I, I'm generally sympathetic to the view expressed by you, Matthew, and others that it doesn't really matter with these movies having perfect sound and picture quality shouldn't really affect our enjoyment too much. But um, watching it now at this beautiful Blu-ray restoration on a recently acquired larger television, I find it much easier to um, to just appreciate as one of their movies without making apologies for it. I have to say, I watched it on VHS on a tiny little television. So we'll, we'll meet somewhere in the middle. <laughs> 
Okay, well, let's start at the very beginning then with the opening titles. First of all, we have them billed as the Marx Brothers, which is not something that happens all that often, um, just billed as a single commodity. Uh, they are, again, in Animal Crackers. After that, they're the four Marx Brothers for a while, and then Groucho, Chico, Harpo Marx Brothers, before becoming the Marx Brothers again in A Night in Casablanca, and despite a contractual stipulation forbidding it, in Love Happy. So that's uh, that's of mild interest. But more interesting is what's going on behind it. When I was young, I could never quite understand why that little bit of film of those people dancing looked so weird. It's it's in negative, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You're just seeing that for the first time? Uh, <laughs> maybe you should uh, move beyond VHS, man. <laughs> But that's a nice little touch, though, isn't it, for uh, for a film of its time, I think? It is. You know, one of the myths of this uh, film is that it's a straightforward uh, filming of the Broadway show, but not really true. First of all, no. as you can see in the, these musical numbers, like the opening, they tried a lot of experimental and different things, shooting up above, things in the foreground, shooting behind, you know, a lot of interesting angles. Uh, the, the comedy scenes are pretty straightforward, but the musical numbers, they were quite ambitious. Mm. Uh, one other thing that really needs to be uh, uh, emphasized, though, is that while they did film pretty much the entire f- show, after the f- initial preview, they cut 45 minutes out of it. So we have lost 45 minutes of footage. Uh, apparently, it's mostly just exposition. But uh, a lot of the plot lines and characters really suffer because of it. We don't know who a lot of these people are. We don't know what their motivations are. We don't even know how they know each other. Yeah, the stage version begins with little scenes that that set up exactly that, that kind of introduce you to Mrs. Potter and Polly and and uh, Penelope and, and Yates. Um, and that has mostly been dispensed with. We have no idea who Harvey Yates is. We have no idea who Penelope is, how they know each other. Is, is yeah. she a sister? X, we, we don't know. How does she know Mrs. Potter? Why do they have rooms next to each other? We don't know any of this. Yeah. And we only find out that Bob works in the hotel about about an hour in, don't we? It's never very convincing, though. Is it? The dialogue suggests that he does. But whereas in the stage version, there are there's a little bit more with him establishing that, you know, Groucho is his boss. Mm. And really is the, the ultimate slap in the face to Zeppo, where the hotel clerk is the romantic lead <laughs> and Zeppo yes, is another hotel him. clerk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one who clerks, Bob, is a clerk, and that settles it. Is a clerk. I guess I've forgotten that line, actually. Yes, that does give it away, doesn't it, earlier? But anyway, uh, sticking with the credits, the, the beautiful cast um, screen, I guess, I'm tempted to say page, because it looks like a theatrical program, doesn't it? They're lovely photos yeah. in, in oval shapes and the, and the names underneath. Um, so I guess we should mention those names. Chico and Harpo are Chico and Harpo. They're not... Uh, Silent Sam and Willie the Wop, which is sort of what they were called in in the in the play. Right. What about these names that are introduced with at the party? At the party, I think that's just their that's their costume names, isn't it? That's their their. Uh, but that's a rare names. example of their actual names almost being spoken on film. You know, His Excellency the yes. Ambassador from San Raffaello, Signor T. Harpano, and Signor mm. Chico Joseph Mala di Acuna, the Count of Elsinore. <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, Silent Sam and the Willie the Wop are, of course, their their criminal names because th- that's how they're known to the police. So, at at a convenience, that's how they're described in the in the the, the play program. But it isn't actually their their character names. It's a it's a subtle point, but I but I think it's important. But more interesting, of course, we've got Groucho as Mister Hammer rather than Mister Schlemmer as he originally was. Uh, the too suggestion Jewish. that this might have been uh, a little bit too Jewish. Yes, um, there was. <laughs> Um, there are one or two possible other um, routes we can take. One, the predictable uh, Hackenbush Beagle route. There was a Schlemmer Hotel in Florida. Um, it was destroyed in the 1896 hurricane, and the more modest Schlemmer Rooming House was built on its foundations the following year. Uh, but it was there at the time. It was there until 1963 when it was bought by the fire department, and they left it in 2003. It's now a library. Um, so that's, you know... One very slight and unlikely possibility. More interestingly, um, in 1923, we have um, a piece in Variety here about a society divorce, the divorce 
of Mrs. Elsie F. Wilkinson and Mr. William J. Wilkinson. And this caught Variety's eye because, and I quote, the lurid dailies in summarising the litigation renamed all over again the seven co-respondents mentioned by the plaintiff. Of these, two, Lillian Walker and Diana Allen, are of the profession. Miss Walker is a screen actress and Miss Allen is a Follies girl. And it goes on to say, the case received considerable notoriety because it involved William F. Schlemmer, head of Hamaker, Schlemmer & Co., the wealthy manufacturing Mm -hmm. hardware concern. Mm -hmm. So again, we have another major Schlemmer uh, who'd been sort of through the ringer a bit quite recently. Um, it's a possibility that uh, any any resemblance to, to, to him wants, they wanted to avoid. Very tempting, of course, to then note the presence of Mr. Hamaker and wonder if uh, the substitute name is a, is a sly reference to that. But in actual fact, as I'm yeah. sure Noah knows better than anyone, um, back in 1919 in their show Un Everything, the brothers played the Hammer family. Yeah, and Groucho is Mr. Hammer uh, later, too, in um, on the mezzanine. So it looks like it was a kind of a standby substitute name. We've discussed previously whether the Ravelli uh, Chico plays in Animal Crackers is the same character later on in uh, The Big Store. Uh, on that same note, is Jamison here the same Jamison that right. uh, shows up in <laughs> Animal Crackers? Did he get fired and... Hook up with Kevin Spaulding? It's an easier case to make for Zeppo since his character has no substance or context in either case. <laughs> it could easily be the same Jamison, but since both Ravellis actually have things to do and say, it's harder to make them match up. <laughs> but also, of course, you being um, an exponent of the of the view that uh, Spaulding might be a, a an interloper, uh, you know, and, oh, yeah. uh, he that could be Mr. Hammer. Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. With Jamison trailing behind. <laughs> One last question about the opening credits. We see that we have the Gamby Hale girls and the Alan K. Foster dancers. Uh, which are which? Uh, <laughs> you can always tell a Gamby Hale girl. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which girls are which, I have to admit. I really should. I hang my head in shame. And I'm sure Chico didn't care either. He's going to sleep with them no matter which troop they belong to. <laughs> right. Did he make his way through the Gamby Hale girls first and then move on to the Alan K. Foster girls, or did he mix it up more? <laughs> and Zeppel got the leftovers. <laughs> okay, so the credits are over, and we've now arrived at the, the lovely land of Florida, where gorgeous women lie about on beaches smoking ciggies and laughing. And we get our first... Lots um, of smoking in this. Yeah, lots of lovely smoking. <laughs> I do love smoking. It's so cool. Uh, lots of lovely smoking. Um Filmed first through through a twirling parasol, which is a nice touch, and then we get a a peculiar montage of shots because some of them are are very impressive. There's one shot of the beach, which appears to have artificial detail in the middle and real people both foreground and back. It's not it's not quite Greg Toland, but it's 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 pretty good. And then it cuts to some dancers in front of a like a hanging cloth with uh, with ripples on it. Um, and there's actually a real water feature, a uh, ocean, yes. uh, in the upper right of the screen where people are coming in, splashing in and out of. That must not have been cheap, uh, oh. getting that and the sand and everything. Uh, you know, Robert Flory wanted to go to Florida and actually shoot some uh, uh, scenes for the opening, uh, establishing scenes. But the studio said, no, uh, you got a guy with a grease paint mustache. We're not going to reality <laughs> here. Uh, you don't need to go on location. We'll bring Florida to you. And I agree, as you say in your book, Matthew, it, it really does create the feeling that we're watching the stage show because it's very much like a very well-designed and well-built stage set of a beach. I can't imagine they would have put that much effort into a stage show, though, with the sand. Probably not the sand and water, but I, I mean, the Broadway production of Coconuts was noted for being really over the top in, in terms of you know fabulous production value. I think that was the perceived as the main difference between this and I'll say she is. So I guess this is as good a point as any to, to bring up the, the technical problems people have with the film, like the, the famous quote about the camera having all the mobility of a fire hydrant caught in a winter freeze. Um, my position has always been not that it's not the case so much as who the hell cares. I'm with Herman Mankiewicz, who said if Groucho and Chico stand against a wall cracking jokes for an hour and a half, uh, that's good enough for me. Um, and we should also remember that a lot of the contemporary reviewers um, 
extravagantly praised the film for the for the very qualities now felt lacking uh pictorial quality visual inventiveness camera angles and sound recording and so much of it was shot um basically live with multiple cameras running from different angles where they would just cut from one angle to another you were almost seeing live versions of these scenes not like okay let's do you know close up of groucho's little bit and then we'll we'll shoot this part that was all basically one take and they Shut, you know, they cut the different angles. Are either of you generally more sympathetic than me to the to the view that that it, it's problematic that the the camera is very static and and you know there's there's not a lot of uh, mobility? No, I have no issue with the lack of camera mobility. Uh, my uh, problems uh, technically with the film are more with the audio. So a lot of the things are not mic'd really well. It's hard to hear. Uh, just the age of the film. There's a lot of hiss. They didn't have the techniques down, and you you weren't getting the real fidelity of Groucho Chico's voice, you know. And to be honest, some of the transitions from scene to scene are just clunky because of the uh, technology of sound editing at the time, and just the whole idea of bringing a, a stage musical. They didn't. There was really no template yet, so just the filmmaking of the time is a bit of a distraction. But does it actually detract from your enjoyment? Not for me, but. I could see how others might have issues with it, particularly those who aren't big film buffs. I'm completely with you, Matthew, in terms of the technical um, limitations or static quality of the movie not mattering to me a bit. Uh, However, traditionally, my take on this film used to be that um, it's not the technical limitations of the filmmaking. It's not that it's not cinematic enough or something, but that the Marx Brothers themselves don't seem entirely comfortable in this new medium and that the performances um, are, uh, I don't know, they're not quite uh, what they would be even one year later in Animal Crackers, that there's a a certain tentative um, quality Mm -hmm. to Groucho and Chico's vocal performances. Uh, Our Mm -hmm. friend uh, Travis D has described uh, the performances in this film as being strangely underwater. And uh, to me, that's a good word for it. Now, this bothers me less and less every time I've seen the movie um, to the point where it really doesn't bother me at all anymore. And I, and I, that's why I do think this is the example of one where the, the restoration dramatically improves the experience. I used to just feel that the voices didn't have their full force. Mm -hmm. You know, the performances Mm -hmm. didn't feel, uh, I think Adamson says that there's a feeling that a powerful spirit has yet to be unleashed. Um, I used to feel that more strongly. You also have to realize this was the first time they were performing material uh, without a live audience. So they, you know, they weren't really sure uh, how they were supposed to to pace their stuff, you know, and whether they were supposed to really be acting and be more realistic or, you know, anything. It was just all, it was just all trial and error, uh, particularly Groucho. Yes. Sometimes he's a little too fast, uh, doesn't give the right pauses. He wasn't really comfortable not having the laughs to play off. I also think they were exhausted. You know, it's wonderful to think of how they were making this movie and simultaneously doing Animal Crackers on Broadway. I mean, it's so exciting to think that when we watch them in the coconuts on film, we are looking at the Marx Brothers as Broadway stars. Uh, But they Mm. were probably dead on their feet from all that work. And I think Groucho in particular is so thin in this movie. I mean, he's always kind of thin, but even one year later in Animal Crackers, he's he's moved on to his kind of pear-shaped thin guy look. (laughs) But in Coconuts, he's like emaciated. I hadn't really struck me, but that's a very interesting point. Yeah. He's pre- he's like emaciated in this movie. He's and I think he's uh, overworked. You know, he's exhausted. And we should talk about the uh, supporting cast. Uh, of course, Maggie is wonderful, but I don't know the rest of them don't really do it for me. They seem to be on a really different wavelength than the brothers. Not really reacting to them the way you would want. They don't really add a lot to my enjoyment of the film. I would make a case for Cave Francis, who yeah. who, who who draws me like a moth to a flame. Um, <laughs> maybe, <don't. laughs> maybe not the others so much. Maybe but. I just don't don't understand her character enough to, to, to know maybe yeah. coming from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dumont too. I mean, Mar- Margaret Dumont is is great, of course, but I feel she grows, you know, to twice her her stature um, one film later. You know, I don't mean physically. <laughs> Did anyone ever tell you you look like the Prince of Wales? 
I don't mean the present Prince of Wales, one of the old Wales. <laughs> And I do mean yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, her, Mrs. Rittenhouse is a much more interesting and vivid and likable character mm-hmm. than Mrs. Potter. Likable, certainly, yes. I mean, this is all very interesting stuff, and we'll we'll touch on it a lot more as we go along. It's certainly not something that I that I want to take up the cudgel about, but it's just it's never been the way the film strikes me. They they all seem to me uh, fully formed and um, even um, at their zaniest at times. To me, it feels like a like a pilot episode of a TV series. All the elements are there, but they're not 100% refined yet. They've gotten the writing, they've gotten the performances, they know what they want to do, but they just haven't done it yet and gotten that last 5% you know, down. I think there's a general consensus that the film is a precious artifact. You know, I, I think we we vary a little bit on how entertaining it is or how representative it is of, of what the Marx Brothers did. But, you know, I've, I think having considered it a precious artifact for so many years um, has helped me graduate to, to fully enjoying it as I do now. Yeah, I agree. The material is just about on a par with Animal Crackers, but uh, perhaps the presentation isn't polished enough yet and that has stood in the way of my enjoyment but i think i've gone past that as as matthew says there there i think there are absolutely you know pockets of them at their best it just isn't as sustained for me as it is in animal crackers and as i mentioned before animal crackers is a bit more polished because they pared it down before they started shooting so what we saw on the screen was pretty much what they intended what we're getting of coconut is a lot different than what they did in the studio. We are getting a, a pared down uh, condensed version, so to speak. It's kind of heartbreaking to think that they cut 45 minutes, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Even though most of it was non Marx stuff, uh, character development and so forth, we would get a better understanding of what is going on. And maybe it would help us appreciate what is left in the film. Yeah. Okay, then, so let's kick the studio sound off our shoes and, and step inside, inside the Hotel de Coconut. And here is uh, Groucho as Mr. Hammer, and one of my all-time favorite jokes. Three years ago, I came to Florida without a nickel in my pocket. Now I've got a nickel in my pocket. Um, this is one of several great lines in the film that I mentioned in my book that show the evidence of fine-tuning before an audience. If you go back to the original play script that was published, you'll find... Uh, Think of the opportunities here in Florida. I came here with a shoestring, and now I've got three pair of buttoned shoes, which isn't half as good. You'll also find, do you know the population of coconut beach has doubled in the past week? Three horses were born. You can just imagine Groucho going through every different animal he can think of before hitting on the exact <laughs> right one, which is a bulldog and a, and a nanny goat. Um, every lot is a stone's throw from the station. The only reason we haven't got any station is because we haven't got any stones. It's the same joke, but it gets perfected uh, in the movie. Uh, and we also have money is not everything and everything's not money. For all I know, that's an epigram. So you can see that that legend of Groucho fine tuning lines um, mm-hmm. you know, is not a legend. It's it's actually what he did, and it does pay off. Really, this scene is a great introduction to Groucho. Yeah, for people who have never seen it before, it's got all his best traits and all his best mm-hmm. uh, attitudes yeah. all rolled into one little thing. I, I like the fact that in in some of these rewrites, you, I mean, it certainly tells us something about Groucho's process, but also Kaufman's. You know, um, in the original um, play script. There's a line in this scene. Groucho says, uh, strike off your chains, strike up the band, strike three, you're out. And I feel like that we can kind of see Kaufman at his desk there trying to figure out how to do this. You know, it's it has all the structure and rhythm of a Groucho line, um, but it's not quite there, you know, and, and the lines in the final version of the scene have a lot more mm-hmm. polish. And I, I think for Kaufman, writing for Groucho, at this point, it must have been like suddenly getting a box of 64 crayons after only using red, blue, and green for years, you know. What, what can I do with this instrument? So many nice lines. Kindly reserve two floors and three ceilings must be mice. You know, well, I have no idea what that means, but it, it makes me roar with laughter. So let me ask this. The bellhops, uh, they're girls. Uh, since they're doing a dance step out at the end, I assume they always were girls, even in the Broadway show. 
I, yeah, I guess so. That's a good question. I, I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of much of a male ensemble, and I guess it was just decided like we'd rather have cute chorus girls in bellboy costumes. Um, I'm looking at the uh, opening night cast list now, and oh, there are, there are a few males list, listed in the ensemble. I suspect this was always the idea: the the bellboys would be cute chorus girls. I love the way Gretchen says, "A few boys will only be calm." Yeah, that is that is obviously intentional. Yeah. Yes, unlike some of the other faux pas mm. later on in the film. Only in a Broadway show would the end of the scene involve the bellhops doing a dance step out. Mm. Hooray! <laughs> kind of yeah, a sweet little marching number, up and down some stairs. <laughs> they all sort of cheer in this kind of unenthusiastic way that suggests they've already done a few takes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And let's not forget Zeppo, who yes. shows up uh, to hand hammer some telegrams and, uh, for no apparent reason, turns towards the camera yeah. to smile and let us know that he's part of the act. <laughs> uh, to be honest, the, the bellhop is actually more important than Zeppo is here. Well, and then we get a specific scene, which is just Groucho saying goodbye to Zeppo, which is sort of like being uh, like, all right, you're, you're out of the movie now. See that? I keep them dancing for their money. Yeah. Jamison, I'm going down. I'll meet the 4.15. Yeah. If I never come back, you'll know I'm still waiting for the train. Yes, sir. And uh, in my absence, I'm relying on you to take good care of everything. Well, you can depend upon me, sir. That's fine. If any guests come in, take good care of them. Yeah. And think of me, Jamison. You bet I will. I'll be back someday. All right. Keep a light burning in the window. Yes, sir. If you can find a window. All right, sir. Goodbye, Jamison. Goodbye. I've uh, I've transcribed this. There, he Zeppo has ten lines. They are as follows. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. You can depend upon me, sir. Yeah. You bet I will. All right. Yes, sir. All right, sir. And goodbye. <laughs> I mean, for Kaufman, it must have been so great. It must have been like being given half a crayon. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't even deliver them well, to be honest. <laughs> I think Zeppo seems kind of happy to be there, though, in a way that he doesn't always in later films he's kind of plucky yes yeah he is and um there's an interesting uh, i'll talk about it a bit more when we get to the um the auction scene but he he's he's an unusual presence in that scene i'll i'll come back to that Mm -hmm. but uh then we meet our villains cyril and Kay. cyril ring the disappearing man of Mm -hmm. american movies who within seconds of completing this film became Hollywood's busiest walk-on man for about another 30 years, but never again uh, commanded a sizable role. Very rarely got a credit, very rarely had a line. Um, there was some whiff of scandal. He's not but, very menacing uh, here. He's, just, he's, he's not. He's, he's a bit of a yeah. wet blanket, isn't he? But as you say, for some reason, he's, he's hooked up with, with Kay Francis, the, the, the sexiest villainess of all time. And we have no knowledge whatsoever of what has brought them together, why she's egging him on. I mean, obviously, we know that they want to steal jewels, but, but why they've teamed up and how. They have a past. Yeah. yeah. Is it a, is it a, a romantic past? No, I don't know, but she keeps saying, oh, it's just like the old days. You know? Yeah. yeah. You know. But I mean, he, he seems like the sort of milk toast figure that she would never go anywhere near. I mean, obviously she's she's in charge of the relationship, isn't she? She's the one uh, egging him on. But I would imagine she, that you know she would she could have had bigger fish to fry. I watched the film again last night with uh, my cousin who is visiting and who had never seen it, and I think had maybe never seen any Marx Brothers movie. And uh, it really stood out to him in this scene that um, Kay Francis is taller than Cyril Ring. He, he was saying that in a movie mm. of this age, it seems very unusual to see a, a shorter yes. man and a taller woman having a, a scene yeah. with some romantic tension. Yes, taller and, and more confident. For Kay Francis obviously went on to become um, a, a significant star of the 1930s, but as late as 1939, in an interview, she said that the most enjoyable experience she ever had in show business was making the coconuts. Ah. That's nice of her. And she only wanted to be forgotten. Hmm. Okay, so now we meet our our much maligned young lovers, uh, Bob and Polly. Um, May I point out here that we sit for a good five seconds <laughs> waiting for the scene to start because pretty much all the music in this film was done live on set. So this had to be 
well orchestrated, well choreographed that yeah. they were going to start saying their lines with the music underneath and then break into a song at a certain point. It had to be well rehearsed and it's not well mixed at all because you, it's hard to make out their dialogue before they start singing. Uh, it's maybe worth mentioning here that this is where in the stage show, Groucho had a song. Uh, Groucho sang a song called Why Am I a Hit with the Ladies? Which, like most of the songs Berlin wrote for this show, is is not great. But uh, this is where it came. And uh, you can find on YouTube a video of Frank Ferrante performing this number. Why am I a hit with the ladies? Tell me why. Do I just fit with the ladies? Tell me, is it a meal? The automobile? Or is it my dancing or my fatal sex appeal? Why am I the center attraction when I never even try? If the call is can be, when one look at me, they seem to cry. I wonder why. It's, uh, you know, it's not a great loss, actually, although it would be nice if Groucho sang something in the movie. As I think you've said in the past, Noah, you, you have to wonder if, if there was a kind of a, a broad and general feeling that perhaps the Marx Brothers shouldn't be singing in, in, in movies. I mean, otherwise it is hard yeah. to hard to credit why something like that wouldn't be in it, but the, the, the bellhops marching up and down the stairs would be. Yeah, that the Marx Brothers are the stars of this musical film and they don't sing, except uh, a little bit in the shirt number later, you know, as part mm. of a group. By the way, at the end of this uh, tune, you'll see that there is a, a band behind them as part of the background with people dancing. And I'm wondering whether that's the actual band that's been playing the music or whether that's a band that's there to portray the band that's playing the music. Well, there was some controversy about that, right? Some felt that if you didn't show the orchestra on film the audience wouldn't accept that the music was coming from nowhere um anyway getting back to to oscar shaw then as as bob yeah um yes he is uh he is not the most dynamic of of characters yes he does look a bit like lon chaney jr yes he does seem very pathetic dragging that wet architectural plan everywhere with him um but he's not in the film much (laughs) i was amazed this time uh just how little screen time he has so he really doesn't get a chance to be too much of a problem Uh, simon luvish points out that he bears a striking physical resemblance to a young richard nixon and ever (laughs) since reading that um i've noticed it every time and it's also in this scene uh and again later on that he he makes reference to john w berryman um who uh Mm -hmm. we should perhaps stop and mention um who that was i spent ages looking for john w berryman assuming that he was a real person from society uh, at the time um but in actual fact he's a he's a fictional character in uh something called business is business which was a a 45 minute playlet that george kaufman wrote with dorothy parker um as a live accompaniment to the film version of beggar on horseback this was something that that uh, as as many of you will know was was done uh, fairly often um, at the time, little live, short live shows to accompany um, big new movies. Um, and in this, in in this little piece um, called "Business Is Business," John W. Berryman was a shoe tycoon, um, a pompous shoe tycoon described uh, by Variety as a bunkum artist whose every mention of his own name is met with a resounding crash of the orchestra. Um, so what we're looking at here is is um, an incredibly subtle in joke. On, on Kaufman's part. It's a good name, isn't it? It's not exactly a funny name, but it's one that gets funny with repetition. Yes. Anything else we want to say about uh, either Bob, Polly, or their little song? Well, I, I think the skies will all be blue when my dreams come true is just kind of a weak number, and I, I regret it a lot because I feel like having a low of opinion of it lumps me in with those who deplore all the musical numbers and <laughs> I love a good romantic song from the 1920s, you know, um, but this one is just not great. And particularly from a genius like Irving Berlin, it, it just feels like he was kind of phoning it in. When my dreams come true, and It 
it's a very uninteresting song, I think. And the skies will all be blue when my dreams come true. Come on, Irving, you can do better than that. <laughs> it, it gets quite strange as well, doesn't it? The Spanish castle I built in my mind will be yeah. a love nest, the practical kind. It's um, yeah. It's quite obtuse. And that's where it gets a little bit interesting, though, isn't it? That, that, that's <laughs> slightly like, oh, what's what's that all about? <laughs> I mean, it, I'd, I'd rather have arcane than than generic. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah, true. Um, anyway, but let's, let's forget that then, because because Maggie debuts next, the one who clerks Polly as a clerk, um, enormously uh, in control of the scene already. I think uh, true, not as three dimensional as as she later. Uh, will be but wonderfully imperious um, and also she gets she gets a joke she gets a laugh line and I want you to remember that no potter has ever been involved in a single scandal how about Uncle Dick Polly it's a well known fact that your uncle was drunk at the time <laughs> very good joke I can't recall any other time she had an actual punchline. Well, I, I, in a day at the races, when she says, "I never knew there was a thing the matter with me until I met uh, okay. him," but it's it is yeah. indeed rare. But it's still it's a different kind of joke, you know. Uh, in this movie and in Animal Crackers, it, it's such a I, partly because it's a younger Dumont than obviously we see in the later films. But um, here, um, her undeniable beauty always mm, occurs yeah. to me, and I, you know, yeah. I mean, she is a very striking and beautiful woman. And I think that was an essential ingredient in making it okay that Groucho insults her appearance so liberally. Well, let me ask a question here. Why exactly is Mrs. Potter and her family staying at this hotel? Uh, they seem to be very well off, but this doesn't seem to be the top place in Florida or the area. And also, why exactly is she hanging out with uh, Mr. Hammer? They don't seem to have a past. Uh, it's not like Captain Spaulding where there's a hero worship thing going on. Uh, I don't really understand exactly why she's even hanging out with him. Uh, maybe it was explained in one of the excise scenes, but they don't really seem to have any connection. I thought they were a well-off family who have somewhat fallen on hard times since her husband's death, and that's why she's so keen to get Polly married off to the Boston Yates. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there anything in the script that says that, or are you just... No, that was just my assumption. Because she was a widow, it is it is it, um, pointed out at one point clearly that she's a widow. So I just wondered if uh, a bit a bit like Maggie herself, she was uh, she was forced to uh, to go back onto the boards, as it were, figuratively in in Miss Potter's case. I think it's interesting that um, whereas usually or in the later stories, um, Dumont has this kind of unswervable and, and inexplicable faith in Groucho. In, in this one, she kind of has that faith in the villain, in Harvey Yates. You know, she, especially in the stage version, she has lines about, you know, he, he lets her know that Polly and Bob have been seen together and people are talking and, and she says, oh, I know I can trust you, Mr. Yates. Um, and I wonder if maybe the seed of the later concept is here like dumont has this kind of misplaced faith in the wrong person and it would just be much more effective when it was faith in groucho it also might be worth noticing that uh, this is her first marx brothers role um in in the coconuts on stage um it was just uh one of the miracles of their career that they found her um and she became of course their perfect foil uh, but characters like the characters she played um, did exist in their earlier work, you know, in, in On the Mezzanine and um, even as far back as Mr. Green's reception. There would be, as Groucho put it in the Marx Brothers scrapbook, he always had a big woman to play against. You know, when we talk about how the Marxes were performing animal crackers on stage here and how they'd have to run back and forth, we have to remember that Maggie was as well. Doing the same. Yeah. She had to go back and really perform a, a totally different character in animal crackers than she's doing here. Yes. And, oh, and it's also worth pointing out that other than those five, this is not the Broadway cast. I, I mean, Dumont and the brothers have done this hundreds of times when by the time they do it on film. But all the other principles, I believe, are, are recast for the film and the material's new for them. Okay, so we, we now have uh, Groucho and, and Zeppo and a scene that, uh, for me, once again, is just crammed with with great lines. Any luck with the 4.30? Yes, it didn't hit me. 
um, get your hat and my coat and get out. Uh, and then uh, with uh, with Maggie, uh, you told me about this yesterday. I know, but I left out a comma. Uh, take the alligator pears, take all the alligator pears and keep them. See if I care. Uh, you've never been an alligator. Don't let it happen again. Uh, uh, all property owners vote on the size of the pipe. In the case of a tie, it goes to the Supreme Court. Um, it, it seems to me just wonderfully energetic stuff, full of great lines. Um, get more good lines in 30 seconds here than you get in like all of Go West. Yeah. And Groucho's energy is up. This feels like uh, this feels like an arrival of the full Groucho. Um, yeah. I never miss an opportunity to refer to avocados as alligator pears myself. Um, <laughs> Groucho found avocados funny, you know, on You Bet Your Life. He often mentioned avocados, his hobby of growing small avocado trees. <laughs> he came up a few times. I also love in this scene when... Uh, Dumont uh, tries to interject something and asks if she can say something and Groucho says, I hardly think so, and just continues so. <laughs> to plow right on. And just the lovely idea of him waving this piece of pipe about that he's kept in his in his pocket as if this is going to be the thing that's going to clinch the deal is is the actual sight of this incredibly small, apart from, apart from anything else, this very, very small piece of sewer pipe. Uh, that's that, that's going to be what convinces her. He also does a, an exaggerated double take when she comes in behind him as if he's scared, which is something that uh, W.C. Fields mm-hmm. does, but but not, not a Groucho-ish uh, thing as a rule. Um, that always makes me laugh. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's a great scene, isn't it? Oh, art fans. Sorry, let me just interject. The painting on the left behind the lobby desk is The Bride and Her Maid by Viennese artist Ivo Saliger. That was My. just for the art fans. Soaked in water. <laughs> <laughs> is it the actual painting? Uh I presume not, because it would have it would have cost cost mm-hmm. Mr. Hammer a pretty penny and he could have sold it, but uh, Yeah. But that's what it is. Um, uh, is it signed in the lower left corner or the lower right corner? <laughs> you know, when you think about Groucho's character here, unlike the rest of the Paramounts, he's he's somewhat vested in the his own well being and the plot line. It's more of a almost more of an MGM Groucho in, in his attitude here. You know, he really cares about hmm. the auction going well and how, how well the hotel is doing. Yeah, he he has genuine responsibilities here, which is not often the case. In in the next several films, no one's looking up to him here. Yeah, he's the hotel. That's true. Yeah. He's also yeah. not really a fraud here. I mean, he legitimately seems to be the owner and manager of this hotel, and he mm. seems to be f- fairly legitimately and earnestly trying to make a success of it. Yes, I mean, he's yes, he's a fraud only insofar as he's a he's a Florida land boom huckster, isn't he? He's uh, yeah, you know, Kaufman has obviously gone and deliberately found a kind of a, a real life function for for that that characterization that from here on uh, nobody would would bother with. Quite a clever choice, actually. Um, anyway, so now we're 18 minutes into the film and something absolutely wonderful happens. Uh, for the first time ever, four Marx Brothers meet. Yeah. Uh, it's a late entry for Chico and Harpo, but it's a wonderful entry. And we have that superb choreographed moment of all four brothers walking around in a circle, shaking hands. Yeah. Uh, one of the great moments of their career. Yes. Yeah, eight, 18 minutes in with the edits. It could have been 30 mm. minutes mm. originally. <laughs> <laughs> It's a perfect and even poetic moment. And it's one of the times in this film when you really do feel like if you squint at it, you could be watching them on Broadway. Mm. Yeah. And out of the blue, the lobby all of a sudden is crowded with people. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, I say all four together, but but not for long, because Zeppo and Groucho will soon be startled by their first hearing of Harpo's Horn whereupon Zeppo will give his first rendering of what to all Zeppo fans savour as his mid-scene escapes. Groucho rushes behind <laughs> the uh, the counter. Zeppo exits the scene. <laughs> and for the first time, uh, which will be repeated in Animal Crackers, Harpo and Chico have basically come there, no bones about it, have come to rip people off. <laughs> yes. You know, they... <laughs> They brag about it, the, the Groucho, the hotel manager. They're basically there to rip people off. And they're not even, they don't even have a good cover story. Yeah, we fill it up before we leave. Yes. <laughs> um, and some of the uh, antics in this scene are wonderful. I'm 
Personally, I'm le- a little bit less delighted, I think, than most are by Harpo eating the buttons and the telephone and dr- drinking the ink. Uh, but Harpo ripping up the mail is, for me, one of the mm-hmm. sublime moments in in the it's the way groucho starts obligingly helping him and yes that's that's really what the marx brothers are about right there yeah and getting back to the eating thing for a second we need to of course keep in mind that this is the first time anybody had seen them so what might seem pretty pedestrian for us these days was really a shock for the people back then like oh my god he's eating this what the hell is going on so, you know, we just always have to keep that in mind when we're watching these gags. I think so much in this film, we we really should always keep in mind that this is going to be the first time uh, people will have seen a lot of this stuff. Uh, so, yes, that would certainly uh, apply to that case. The pickpocketing, the giving of the leg, all that stuff that, that, that you might say, oh, they did better later on, but they never did it for the first time yeah. again. Yeah. You know? A lot of this stuff is... Um, is standard for them too. And it's clearly business that they elaborated upon in rehearsal. Um, there's even a line from, I'll say she is, um, and the boy wins a gold cigar, um, is just lifted straight out of the courtroom scene. And I'll say she is. And of course it anticipates the moment in duck soup when he shoots the record fung in the air and gets a cigar. Yeah. Oh, and a tiny subtle moment that makes me laugh is, um, when Groucho offers the, buckwheat flour to Harpo. Yes. And Harpo takes one and eats it, and Grouch just says, I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, we should point out that Harpo um, drank ink in Spanish Nights, their kind of interim show between uh, Coconuts and Animal Crackers, because uh, they, these um, th- those ideas were, are often credited to Robert Florey the film's director yeah but uh uh, the the ink drinking at least uh was harpo's own and 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 predated it okay the plot marches on we have uh the first of many detectives with names like hennessy uh (laughs) Mm -hmm. who obviously have have previous experience of harpo and chico but no idea whatsoever of 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 how to go about apprehending them despite the blatancy with which they uh display their criminality he he wanders on for a typically lugubrious scene. <laughs> oh, this guy was in the Broadway show. Uh, uh, Basil Risdale, who plays. Oh, Hennessey. was he? Yeah, uh, I really like and, him. Yes, he and and Dumont and the brothers. Yeah, he's wonderful. Uh, in addition to being a character actor, he was legitimately an opera singer, and later on, he gets to demonstrate that. Ah, I wonder if if that suggested it somehow. Yeah, mm. I wonder. Yeah. Um, I like. What comes next, which is the the, the scene where the scenes where where uh, K Francis flirts first with Chico and then then with Harpo, but particularly with with Chico because obviously she's playing up to him for a reason. Uh, but we do mm-hmm. nonetheless get a sense of a of a of that kind of swaggering sexual confidence that that apparently the real Chico possessed there's a genuinely flirtatious dynamic between them particularly when she says uh you know you look like the prince of wales better (laughs) how about when he says maybe you got a good idea yes (laughs) that always seems like just one inch away from creepy yes yeah but you know he that, that confidence is not what you would expect of the character i'm going to post a photo of what the actual prince of wales looked like <laughs> so we can get better context <laughs> see whether or not chico looks better yeah um and it's matched by an equally uh an equally good joke in the in the harpo scene where uh she says you look like the prince of wales and he just nonchalantly says oh yes yes I, you know i do you know and, and she says oh i thought that was an original idea of mine and he does a, he does a face like oh no 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 it's as if it had been said hundreds of times yes <laughs> he's beautiful in that scene and it's a yeah. great example of harpo and and all the marx brothers are are their examples of this it's so much subtler than people think it's not so big and broad and crazy and manic harpo is tiny I, you know it's just these very subtle little mm. gestures that add up to this kind of satire of social mores you know but it's uh it's extremely subtle uh, one wonders if it could possibly have been that subtle on stage in, in the penelope chico exchange um i i must uh, i'm duty bound to point out there's another lift from i'll say she is about the coat it doesn't fit you. I know. I had it made to order. Uh, also from the courtroom scene in I'll Say She Is. Hmm. 
And a good trivia point that uh, we get the first musical performance by a Marx Brother on screen, and it's Harpo playing the clarinet. <laughs> yeah. Clarinetto, yeah. Which is another <laughs> delightful reason to be thankful for this movie, isn't it? Is it him actually playing, or is it somebody off screen playing for him? I think it's mm-hmm. him. I think it's him. Okay. And he certainly <laughs> played the clarinet. Mm-hmm. We then move on to another historic first, the first Groucho and Margaret Dumont wooing scene. Uh, and again, I, it, for my money, it's it's uh, it's a it's a, a classic straight out of the gate, uh, fully formed. Maggie, I think, is is a little bit spikier and sparkier than than she would eventually be, and she has a a, a, a truly terrifying what? Oh, that's that's an insult. Uh, at one point. <laughs> Uh, Which is interesting because he's been insulting her the whole time, yes. and she picks this some random joke in the middle of it to say that's an insult. After he's called her a whale and everything else, which he's just not responding to. Yeah. Yeah, but being compared to a suit is an insult. Yeah. I true. find this scene a little, I mean, it has its pleasures, certainly, but I, I find it uh, weaker than their later love scenes. And uh, partly it's that... Um, it seems a little um, inorganic the way Groucho gets confused. If, if you are inside out and I was upside down, he doesn't seem to really earn that verbal mix up. He just kind of decides to get flustered, which is untypical of him. And it's so un, you know, un, unbidden by the scene. It, it feels forced. Um, it, it's, there's also something about when the way she says, Will you keep your hands to yourself? It's like a little too real, a little too plaintive, and it makes me feel sorry for her more than I want to. Uh, but she does get her first ever, what in the world is the matter with you? <laughs> Which is something she, I'll never get tired of her saying that. And the uh, blue serge suit joke mm-hmm. from the Napoleon scene, and I'll say she is. Ah. <laughs> and the fact that she's a widow and that Hammer even knows this uh, sort of comes out of the blue. And uh, it sort of hints to the fact that perhaps there was more to their backstory that has been cut out of the film. Hmm. This too, like in, later on in Duck Soup, when, um, you know, he suggests that her husband's not really dead, but is just using that as an excuse. And she held him and kissed him. And so it was murder. Like, because the comedy is so strong and so sure of itself there, um, you know, no cruelty or pain comes across at all. But here it does feel almost a little too cruel cross-examining her about whether her husband is really dead <laughs> without a great joke attached to it. Yeah, we don't know what their history is or, or the background. At the beginning of Duck Soup, we know that they know each other. So here we you have no idea whether this is like within an hour of the meeting. Mm-hmm. Especially as well, bearing in mind that she was a real widow of a you know not not so long ago her her husband died yeah. you know you have you have to bear that in mind i think yeah it's a three star scene for me but not a four star uh, one little subtle it's a template joke that made me laugh this time that i didn't remember particularly noticing before is that towards the end he ends up kind of on his knees with his arms around her waist uh, and he says can you come down a little bit as as if she was the <laughs> one in in a in a, a strange position rather rather than him you know <laughs> He is getting awfully familiar with her, considering she said to get his, her hands, his yes. hands off her. And the scene where he says, you know, I'm stuck with the hotel. Why don't you grab me till you can make other arrangements? That's an interesting moment. That almost feels like a real line from a romantic comedy. And it sort of feels like he is earnestly suggesting mm. to her, like, hey, we'd be good together, don't you think? Uh, and it has a more realistic note to it than their later love scenes usually do. So is it at this point that the the little bungalow song should have come in and and maybe you know sweetened that 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 situation a bit? Yeah, this was one of a few places where that song was performed in the stage version. A little bungalow is one of a number of songs from the stage version of Coconuts that you can hear on YouTube. There is a Victor recording from 1926 called Gems from Coconuts with the Victor Light Opera. Um, and you've got um, a little bungalow and the monkey doodle do tango melody, which is heard instrumentally in the film, but not vocally and Florida by the sea. And also the song lucky boy, which was sung twice. Here's a little bungalow now uh, performed, I believe by Billy Murray. A little bungalow, an hour or so from Shady trees with birds and bees and not for that. 
So right, so so Groucho didn't sing on the on the record. I guess that was never even considered. Oh, unfortunately not. Yeah, uh, this may have. I guess it's fairly likely though that this um, this was in the preview cut. You know, before those cuts were made. Uh, we I guess we know the song was in it. Whether it was performed by Groucho, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I, I suspect so. Okay, next up is another of those key firsts it's our first ever harp solo um and yes i guess his name is a tip off but for many audiences seeing it for the first time uh seeing this this uh wild dervish like comedian suddenly uh giving way to the muse in so simple and gorgeous a way uh it must have seemed utterly magical uh obviously filmed live uh filmed mostly from from one angle tight on the strings um as uh, very very simple very very beautiful and not a bad melody either yeah once we take those hokey lyrics out into the film it really could have fit in anywhere it's just the him finding the harp playing and then that's it that could have been put anywhere in the film and this is a rare shuffling of the sequence too in in the stage version the harp solo comes along with the piano solo in the party scene at the end but here i think it's very wisely moved to yeah, earlier yeah. in the film and and uh it's not there's no context around it but it it works a lot better in terms of pacing i think mm-hmm. than if it was lumped in with the piano solo at the end uh, watching this last night with my cousin who had never seen it and who who knows about the Marx Brothers from reading my book, but I'm not. Sh- but maybe had only seen them in a limited way. Uh, definitely made an impression on him that the movie stopped for this beautiful, but if you're not used to it, inexplicable harp solo, mm-hmm. um, and how it seems um, both so contradictory of Harpo's comic character, and then it also seems to make that character so much deeper and more profound that he has the ability to sit down and do this. Yes. It really does put a a, a nice context on all his other antics. Yeah. Um, But obviously, you know, for every time from now on, uh, you, you know, he's going to do it at some point, but uh, you know, it's all, it's always a a hidden side of him that you're waiting for. But that first time uh, it's, it's, it's not just that it's, it's not something that you know he can do. It's something that seems so alien to him um that that you know that kind of of sophistication uh and it's and it's as if he's sort of saying i've always got this up my sleeve i'm just choosing not not to be this person i could be this person all the time but i don't want to be and once again of course we have to remember that people are seeing them for the first time and yeah they know his name is harpo but maybe they're thinking he's going to do a funny harp bit or Mm. play a, uh, a gag song so the fact that he plays something mm, serious and mm, beautiful mm. and wonderful is quite powerful. 
and obviously this is the key to the to the thing that you you mentioned bob uh that that, that you know um reviews for, for years ever after say it's good but it's not as good as the coconuts the coconuts is always held up as the gold standard it's simply because it was i suspect at any rate it, it's because it was that first sampling of them and without constant reissues and you know certainly not without certainly without home media uh, no chance to go back and and actually compare and contrast so they're going on their memory of of seeing something mm-hmm. the like of which they had never seen before Right. You know, so many of uh, people in, uh, in our Facebook group say, oh, I have a soft spot for the big store because this was the first time I ever saw them. Mm. You know, well, imagine the whole country you know, mm. experiencing mm. them for the first time. That, that's the coconuts. Dick Cavett says, I think on the, the Nutshell documentary that uh, his, I think he says it's his father told him that when they, when coconuts came out, people were literally, and I mean literally, not figuratively, falling out of their seats laughing. It must have been totally overwhelming. And if you consider that for much of the audience, this probably was their first ever experience with the Marx Brothers. It's very interesting that the clarinet solo precedes the harp solo. So conceivably, someone might get to the harp solo and think, oh, he plays the harp too. Mm -hmm. I always thought of him as a clarinet playing comedian. Yes. (laughs) And there's still no let up. Romantic leads. What romantic leads? We're on to the glorious adjoining room sketch next. Uh, more, more brilliant yeah. comedy material, this time visual, uh, largely and recreated visually, very simply, very effectively. Uh, and again, with a real tang of the stage. Now, when they did this on stage, were there, was there a divider like that going down the center? Were people all over the theater were able to yeah. comprehend it? Yeah, and and it's it's interesting. I mean, one of the few differences with the film version is since on film we start in Penelope's room and we don't cut back to the cutaway view of both rooms until a little bit later. So it begins, you kind of feel like the location is just this one room, whereas on stage... I'm, I assume the curtain opened on that cutaway set and you immediately knew, ah, we're going to be paying attention to the action in, in two locations at once. Do you think it would, have been, it would have worked better had it just been go back and forth between the rooms rather than doing this gimmick with the split screen? No, I, I think that's what's novel and interesting about it. And, um, you know, what makes it so wonderfully busy that we can simultaneously see uh, you know, an exit and an entrance happening at the same time. I'm not that crazy about it. I mean, it's well executed. It's certainly frantic, but I don't find it especially funny or entertaining. It's well done. And it's, you could see that they've done this on stage a hundred times, a thousand times, and that they're, they have these cute, the door slamming cues mm-hmm. to know when to come in and come out, uh, which also make, begs the question of what, if the audience was laughing real hard, if they ever missed the cue because uh, they didn't hear a door slam. I'll bet the timing has a lot to do with, you know, what the laughter was like. And, um, you know, it has that sort of percussive, farcical, um, machine-like um, timing to it. And it's um, it's the first of many descendants of the Napoleon scene, in- including even some of the same dialogue. Did he go? Who? Anybody. Uh, <laughs> that's from uh, Napoleon. Uh, there are so many individual beautiful moments here. I love, um, uh, at one point, Groucho makes an unnecessary trip into the room to walk around the detective in a circle without yes. being seen, you know. Uh, that That's another, that is the Marx <laughs> Brothers, you know, just yeah. for the pure joy of being mm-hmm. mischievous. It totally um, not useful to what the plot is trying to accomplish, but Groucho can't resist the fun of making that extra trip. I also love his little twirl. It seems like a maybe an accidental moment, but at one point the camera is panning across and Groucho is sort of caught in this twirl where he he does a, a kind of, I don't know, like an action-packed sort of double yeah. take. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a beautiful moment. And every time I see it, I think um, that that should be included in a montage of some kind. It's a very dynamic moment for Groucho. And it has to do with the movement of the camera. Penelope actually has a couple of moments here that make me laugh. Uh, you know, with all this madness going on with people running in and out, uh, she finds a two second lull as safe to go in and actually steal the necklace. Yeah. You know, it's been going on constantly for five minutes. And because it stops for five <laughs> seconds, she thinks it's okay to all of a sudden run into Mrs. Yeah. Potter's uh, room. But, uh, 
after she steals the necklace, and she's in Mrs. Potter's room, for some reason, she doesn't go back in through the adjoining door. She goes out the front door <laughs> to go back around into her oh, yeah. room again uh, for no apparent reason. You know, People aren't going to see her coming out of the room. And when they find out later on that there's a, a necklace stolen, of course, she's going to be implicated. Why did, why did she go out through the front door? <laughs> on my list of uh, lines that are not quite great jokes, but they just amuse me a lot and I like them, uh, is definitely when Groucho... <laughs> says to Margaret Dumont, uh, thank you. Why don't you give him a dime? Uh, referring to the bellboy. <laughs> yes, yes. It's just funny that he goes out of his way to like <laughs> stick up for this bellboy deserving a bigger <laughs> yes. tip. You know, he's, Who he's refusing to pay because it would make him a, a wage slave. But yeah, <laughs> yeah give, him a, give right, him a dime. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's like a, he's taking the posture of defending the little guy who he is himself <laughs> oppressing. <laughs> yeah, it's... Not a big laugh, but a very funny moment. Yeah, and obviously this influenced the uh, the somewhere seen in a night at the opera with the rooms with the room switching. Which mm-hmm. by that time the sound cinematic art had advanced enough where they were able to communicate the madness in my mind so much better. It's more cinematic, but I I prefer the first. I can't I can't help. Yeah, it, I think I might like this. I've one seen better. every doc- Doctor in the East. I don't get I don't get a lot of laughs out of it. Uh, we get in this scene uh, our first example of Harpo honking into the telephone, as he will later on in Duck Soup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The phone rings. Harpo runs to it, enthusiastically picks it up, and just starts honking his horn. So that's the adjoining the adjoining doors uh, scene. And after that, we have the water carnival. No, we don't. We plow straight on. <laughs> We plow straight on. Still no romantic couple. Remember Bob Adams? We haven't seen him for a long time now. It's Wire Duck. Wire mm-hmm. Duck comes in straight after the uh, the adjoining doors. Obviously, we discussed this at length in our uh, our Groucho Chico show. But uh, this film is just just comedy, comedy, comedy. Yeah. And the best bit in Wire Duck, of course, is the huge tear making its way through the map as, as Groucho uh, attempts to put it. That tear that just gets longer and longer right through the middle of that map. I, I really like your point, Matthew, in your book, which I reread last night, that um, not only is the wet map distracting, it's not necessary. He doesn't need to handle it at all <laughs> really in this scene. It could just be, yeah, could just be sitting on the table and they could point to it and it would have been fine. I noticed one effect, I think, of seeing this movie in the restored Blu-ray version on a giant screen is um, I I notice, especially in this Wyatt Duck scene, how Groucho and Chico's costumes look like costumes. You know, they look like clothes that are being professionally cleaned once a week and getting a real workout in between. They have the the lines that I recognize from theatrical costumes, a, a jacket that you take on and off, you know, 10 times a night every day. Um, it's wonderful. Chico's lapel even has some kind of white smudge on it that looks like mm. it might be makeup or chalk or <laughs> yes. something. Um and in this case, because it's appropriate for these characters to be sort of raggedy and moth-eaten, it's, um, it adds a touch of uh, realism. Okay, so then we're off to the auction and we have mm. the Monkey Doodle Do. Um, we, we'll talk about that song in a moment. But first, even if you hate the song, uh, at the risk of my sounding like a, a stuck gramophone record, let's, let's reiterate what we've been watching so far. This film has now been on for over 50 minutes. Um, apart from one schmaltzy mm-hmm. song right at the start, uh, a little bit of woof, 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 woof to go with it, uh, some prancing bellhops, and the barest minimum of uh, exposition villainy, it's been mm-hmm. more or less solid Marx Brothers to this point, and for my money, absolutely uh, yeah. solid gold. This is the first we'll see of Polly in over half an hour. We've still only seen Bob Adams once. Uh, my question is, what post-Paramount film bats at anything like this average you're right absolutely right you know it's it's one of the most uh comedy uh you know comedy focused of all their films i think almost nothing gets in the way and particularly the young lovers i think it's not really until uh a night in casablanca and then even uh not as much that the young lovers are (laughs) as incidental and impatiently dealt with yeah, well, in Duck Soup, they're done away with altogether. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I mean, it is true that um, although Coconuts is mostly unadulterated Marx Brothers comedy, Animal Crackers is more so. So it, it may be just the point of comparison that makes people. I mean, I, I don't feel the the you know romantic story or the music is intrusive in Coconuts, but but I can see that it's less so, even less so in Animal Crackers. It could be the beginning of the film because you you know you got this this opening montage that goes into a Florida song and you get a nice little Groucho scene and then you get another whole dance number. Mm -hmm. So it's the, maybe that first seven or eight minutes of the film that have stuck in people's minds. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, combined with the fact that we wait so long for Harpo and Chico's entrance. So it, it feels like they are sort of restrained and delayed. Mm -hmm. And also I think Animal Crackers plays out on a much wider canvas. There's a huge cast. It's a big party. The, the, the screen is full of people. And the Marx Brothers, although they're, they're on screen most of the time, they're interacting with various people and various things. This is a much more intimate film. It's mainly played out in, in, in duologues and, uh, you know, much, much smaller scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, then The Monkey Doodle Doo, uh, a much maligned number. I rather like it. Oh, a little monkey playing on his monkey gives them all the cue to do the monkey doodle do. Let me take you by the hand over to the jungle band. If you're too old for dancing, get yourself a monkey glance and then let's go. A little theory is the Darwin theory telling me I'm you. I love the number. To me, this is the good song from the Coconuts. I, I think it's great. And and the one Irving Berlin composition in this work that really does it for me. I'll tell you who doesn't like it. The people in the scene. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're walking around. They're, they're having conversations. They're not paying attention at all until maybe the last five seconds where they turn not, around and start applauding. Not until... They're not, uh, they're, not, they're not impressed at all. Not until Celebrity Day in the big store where... Uh, Tony Martin records that record and, <laughs> and draws a crowd of zero. <laughs> Has a crowd been less interested? Yes. Just, just watch the yeah, just watch the watch the other people in the scene as this musical number is going on. They couldn't be less interested. In my uh, lecture, uh, my illustrated lecture, the Marx Brothers on Broadway, um, there's a bit that I love doing where I um, I play the recording of the Monkey Doodle Do and show the lyrics on the screen. Um, and and speak through the lyrics too. And you know, if you really dig deep into the lyrics of this song, um, it's very rewarding. <laughs> um, there is even a monkey gland reference, which I think is more than any of us could have. A monkey for. gland reference and the rhyming of dearie with Darwin theory is lovely. Uh, you know, to think <laughs> yes. to think Darwin was That's worried about mangoes uh, and gangos. <laughs> to think Darwin was worried about the effect his uh, his discoveries might have on uh, you know on, on the cultural pool uh would it get bastardized <laughs> would it get trivialized no of course not i i know it is i guess a minority opinion but i think the monkey doodle do should be our national anthem <laughs> <laughs> okay then we go straight oh oh, well, oh let's point out that irving berlin wrote two songs called the monkey doodle do this is the second oh. there's no similarity between them they're completely different songs but in i I think it was 1913 or, or 15, uh, he wrote an earlier Monkey Doodle Doo and then <laughs> this one. And that's remarkable in itself. And it I, is. I can only conclude that. But it has the lyric Monkey Doodle Doo. Both the both lyric both. and title, yeah. That's the only, uh, be, the similarities wow. begin and end there. And that's. So was it a common slang? Not that I know of. I, I just think if you're as prolific as Irving Berlin. Yeah. It's inevitable. That That's you'll, why you'll write he was a, a genius. Of monkey doodle doos. How, how many of us can yeah. say we've even written <laughs> one monkey doodle do? This guy wrote two. Very few of us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm quoting from my my bit about it here, but I think also that if you put twelve monkeys in a room with a typewriter, they will eventually <laughs> write the monkey doodle do too. <laughs> so, is there a recording of the first one? Uh, I don't think there is. I think on YouTube there is what seems to be one, but it turns out it's the coconuts version with the original sheet music. Uh -huh. uh, the sheet music is out there though. So if you are dying to hear the 1913 monkey doodle do, um, you can hear it that way. Somebody then can, can get that and do a little version on YouTube for us. Can, Somebody out there listening. Play it for us. Yes. It, yeah. Um, 
straight back to the magic after this we've got the auction um not everybody's favorite scene it must must be said uh it's certainly one of my favorites um Groucho's personal guarantee being a, a, a one of my all-time favorites uh, moments of his way. work yeah. uh, anybody want to buy a lead pencil you got to get up early if you want to get out of bed um, and also I, I just I love the way he says <laughs> lot number 20 20 <laughs> <laughs> and we do get a first in this scene uh, Groucho actually addressing the camera yes indeed do I hear four four hundred dollars well, the auction is practically over. It's all over but the shooting. I'll attend to that later. Yeah, he's often credited with having pioneered this on film. Um, it's been pointed out that in silent films, eye contact would be made with the camera during an Oliver Hardy slow burn, for example. But Groucho is the first actor on film ever to speak to the audience. And for him, uh, it was just uh, an adaptation of what he'd been doing for years on stage. But apparently it was noted and it was sort of a bracing moment when Groucho looked at the audience and spoke to them. Um, it, it Also, we might as well say uh, in this podcast that just the sounds of Groucho's and Chico's voices um, in this film are little revolutions in themselves compared to the very stilted mid-Atlantic yes. theatrical diction that all yeah. early talkies are full of. These guys are just talking like street people from New York. Yeah, just comparing them to the rest of the people in the film. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know? And we can see where a later scene was influenced. Uh, you know, Chico uh, uh, making a mess of this auction. You can see how this influenced the cigar scene and at the circus mm-hmm. and how they look back, you know. Yeah. A lot of people who don't like this scene point to that as, as one of the reasons. They say uh, in the later films or the subsequent films, Chico is is wily, whereas here he's just he's just being stupid. He just doesn't get it. Um, but I think actually about halfway through the through the scene, it, it it turns, and I think he does get it, and it becomes a duel between him and Groucho. Uh, that lovely bit where Groucho says "Too late, too late" in a it's really strange high pitched voice that he doesn't <laughs> normally uh, use. Um, I, yeah, but, but hasn't he made it clear to Chico that he's going to get a cut if this goes well? Possibly so. Yeah, they, they'd much rather create uh, uh, uncomfortable situations than than uh, necessarily serve their own best interests. Now let's go to the end of the scene where Maggie comes in uh, saying her necklace was stolen. I've been robbed. <laughs> Harpo goes over and pulls the necklace out of this hollow tree stump uh, that's right in the middle of the scene. Now this is the same hollow tree stump that they mm-hmm. were referring to much earlier. This is where the auction is taking place. Yeah. Huh. Presumably, it seems a little easy to get to. Either. Harvey didn't realize that was where they were doing it. Uh, or yeah, everybody just standing right in front. Yeah, of them. I guess it's. I find it strange and, and kind of inexplicable, although <laughs> useful to the story. That um, as soon as the accusation is made, Bob just acts guilty. Mm. He's he's not. But as soon as the detective asks him a question, he he gets very surly. He's not answering any questions. Yeah, he asks, "Who's the girl?" As Bob is hugging Polly, like, "Come on." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's no real reason to suspect him. The 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 reason Yates gives is it, uh, just can I make a suggestion? It, it, don't you think that the, the you know it's a really crappy reason to suspect him? But the police just instantly <laughs> think, "Yep, that's him. That's our man." Um, that sounds very plausible. To Margaret <laughs> <Dumas>. <laughs> yes. But anyway, here we do have Bob showing up uh, for the second time in the movie. One hour in, he makes his second appearance. Yeah. He and Zeppo have been busy clerking. Yes. <laughs> but then as soon as this happens, he's he's dragged off by the police, you know, and he says, you're not going to have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. <laughs> and, and then Dumont just announces that Polly will marry Harvey Yates. <laughs> oh, and it's at this point that, that the thing I mentioned earlier that happens, just before Bob's taken away, uh, he has his little tearful farewell with Polly and he says uh, um, you stay here it, it, it's uh, it'll only be a little while or something Why, like the that. whole thing is ridiculous <laughs> yes. mm. if you look at Zeppo Zeppo mm. is stood behind him um, uh, and as as we saw earlier Zeppo's already 
patented his technique of scooting out of scenes uh, when as soon as his lines dry up. So this is a very rare example of a scene where he has nothing to do, but he's he stood there, um, particularly in Animal Crackers. Um, you know, a whole hour goes by. Mm. He's not he's not at the uh, he's not at the unveiling of the painting. He's not at the uh, the soiree. Uh, but here he stood there, mm. and he looks. Once you notice him, he looks utterly terrifying. I mean, I don't want to play this uh, too heavy handedly, but but he he's frozen like a statue. He's just kind of staring. Uh, Polly and Bob, uh, he's absolutely without any animation at all. And once once you notice it, you can't take your eyes off him. It's it's a you know it's a longish moment between Polly and uh, and Bob. And stood behind them is Zeppo, like the angel of death. For me, it's a scene where often the little chatter is funnier than the big jokes. You know, the little incidental asides, uh, get away from that tree before it dies. Um, the real pleasures of the scene, I think, are there. The, the main comic premise of what Chico is doing to the auction is fine, and I think it works reasonably well, but it feels like, I don't know, there maybe there if there had been one more take or something. It just feels not quite as focused a comedy scene as it could be. Notice that when Harvey is trying to bid on a lot and Harpo is throwing a coconut down to stop him, that it's not timed exactly right. Then Harvey has to sit there for like a second or two, uh, <laughs> not saying the number, so that Harpo can throw the coconut down. It's not edited right. It's not timed right. Uh, yeah. I get a kick out of that stuff. I think in the stage version, the um, Harpo just hits him with a blackjack, right? Or um it's not a coconut, I can't remember. Something other than that uh, uh, very nice insert shot of Harpo up in the tree dropping the coconut mm. uh, is a development for the film. Oh, and this is also, of course, the scene with the with the cut in it involving a snake. What is that? A, a cut involving a snake? Yeah, Harpo, Harpo uh, produces a snake. Uh, it's, in, it's in the script, oh. and uh, there are yeah. stills of it. So it, it obviously was shot. So perhaps this explains all the later times when Chico guesses that Harpo has been involved with a snake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, right. When Harpo pantomimes a, a, a female form. And we get one of those uh, weird moments where things happen twice, like in Animal Crackers, where Groucho gets out of the carriage twice. This time we get uh, the inspector walking in to the middle of the crowd twice, once on a medium shot and once on a long shot. I love those. Okay, so now uh, finally the, the the plot has uh, has asserted itself. So we should be uh, we should be in mm-hmm. for a for a, a downward turn. Uh, Bob has been carted off to jail. Polly has been paired off with uh, with the odious Harvey Yates, uh, and we're at a kind of a a sentimental helping the young lovers moment. But what actually happens uh, is yet another uh, rather wonderful moment. Harpo with the lolly, which is, I think, one of the Mm -hmm. transcendent moments of world cinema, comparable to the last shot of City Lights or the end of Bresson's Pickpocket or the leper scene from Rossellini's St. Francis. Uh, Harpo's face, the utter innocence of it. Um, Again, what audience member would be expecting such a wonderful moment at this point? Yeah, I agree. It's it's a beautiful little moment, so beautiful that it was uh, repeated in Animal Crackers. And it takes the edge off the earlier scene where he has come out of Penelope's bed as the scene fades out. It sort of yes. softens the whole uh, character. But like, you know, like the harp solo, it's it kind of pulls the rug from under, mm. from under the audience. It's you, you, you can't quite put your finger on this character. He's not who you think he is. There mm. are, there are so- yeah. contradictory mm. sides to him um, that, that add up to a, to a confusing but extremely attractive whole. Yeah, he eats telephones and he steals <laughs> silverware, but he's the guy whose shoulder you cry on when your heart is broken. Time then to 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 get Bob out of jail, the the prison breakout scene. Some 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 good laughs in this scene. Um it's important to point out that it's no, I've been winning It's for a this. new scene. It's written for the film. Hmm. Uh hence uh Chico's uh comparative lack of familiarity with it, but uh let's not get carried away about no. that. Yeah, I want to get into this. There is this thing that's been going on on the internet where people are claiming that Chico forgot what was going on or messed up his lines and that Oscar Shaw had to cover for him. But uh, it, it's, yeah. to me, it's clear that Chico says uh, Yates and Polly. Um, it's a little sloppy, but it is all there. So I don't know why people think otherwise. Uh, you know, If mm-hmm. he had forgotten, they would have taken the scene again. I mean, they weren't that cheap on film. 
Well, there's, there's one point of confusion, which, which we'll get to if you play the clip. You've got to come out there. Uh, uh, Polly, she wants you. Polly wants me? She's got to have you because tonight she's going to be uh, engaged. Gonna engaged? Be, yeah, it's going to be married. Mrs. Potter, she's going to give a, a big uh, engagement dinner. Who? Every, to who? To Polly. The Yates to Polly. Everybody's going to be there. You Polly's going to marry Yates? That's right. That's right. Come on, let me out of here. Get me out of here, quick. So it's all there. Chico says, Yates to Polly. Yeah. He, he's clearly... It, He's obviously stumbling. He's obviously unfamiliar with the with the lines. But what 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 the problem is is that when he says, to my mind, with one hundred percent clarity, to Yates to Polly, other people hear engaged to Polly. In other words, he doesn't say the name. I Yates. do. You hear engaged. That that's always how I I have heard it, and only when reading it the other way in your book, Matthew. Have I gone and listened to it and thought, oh, okay, I, now I feel like it could be either. I had read about this mess up, and I'm watching the scene like, okay, where's the mess up? Mm. And it doesn't come. And I went back and I said, and I saw that people didn't hear that one line. Right? Yeah. And it is maybe not as emphasized as much as it should be, but it is all there. Yeah. He's obviously not saying it properly, but he, but he is. he does get that information across. It's interesting um, that, I mean, even if, even if you accept that he is saying uh, Yates – to Polly and they're therefore clearly making his point because as you point out, Chico still seems to be rather struggling here. Um, you know, it, it, it still holds up like the idea that he didn't quite know his lines here still holds up. Yeah. And it's very, what it winds up being is an unusually naturalistic acting moment for Chico. Mm. In contrast to what Oscar Shaw is doing. Yes. is a whole different type of acting. <laughs> uh, who, who has ever said when sitting in jail, I might as well be here as any other place. That's <laughs> such a bizarre thing for a prisoner to say. Um, for what it's worth, I'm looking now at um, a, a transcript of the closed captions, which, which does have the line the way you guys hear it, Yates to Polly. Uh, now, that's obviously the way somebody heard it when they were writing these titles up. But for what it's worth, there it is. Yeah, I, mean, I think with the, you know, with the improved uh, sound on the new, uh, the new Blu-ray and everything, I think you can, you can definitely hear the tut and the ya uh, and, and there's no ga and there's no na, you know. I think it's a, it's a closed. Well, let's call in Andrea Orlando and <laughs> she'll, she'll clarify. Yeah, Andrea, are you on the line? I guess not. All right. <laughs> <laughs> She'll tell you it's really Zappa. <laughs> now, isn't Bob going to get into a lot of trouble for breaking out of jail, uh, even if he is innocent? That inspector doesn't seem too understanding. Yeah, he's committed a crime now, hasn't he? He hadn't. Mm. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, uh, he could have, you know, those that that bar that Harpo nonchalantly breaks, he could have, he could have just slipped out anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. I think that it, yeah. we, we pay so much attention to Chico's struggle in this scene, right. um, we, we might um, ignore somewhat the sublime Harpo moments with the bar, and then also very deliberately hitting his own thumb with the hammer. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Carefully yeah. and in a studied, practiced exactly. way, hitting his That's own That's what makes it funny. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. And, to, and to get that in 1929. Yeah, for so many other comedians, though, the gag would have been, oh, he locked himself in the cell at the end. But then just the top mm. with him being able just to break out. Yeah. That, that's just a total understanding of where the character is going. Right. And yeah. what makes the Marx Brothers special? Why they aren't Laurel and Hardy. They're not inept. Mm. They do the wrong thing out of <laughs> joyful irreverence. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, so next we have a scene, or we think we're going to have a scene, with Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Bob. But um, mm-hmm. interestingly enough, Chico does a zeppo. He actually excuses himself and and, and yeah. leaves, yeah. which is which is odd because you would have thought he might have might have usefully added to the fun here. Um, but we get some excellent Harpo thievery, uh, some really impressive, uh, not just funny, but actually uh, impressive. Wow. <laughs> it's our new video doorbell. <laughs> I don't know what the woman's doing. Get away from here. <laughs> Sorry about so, that. So yeah, so we get some we get some excellent uh, Harpo thievery. Beautiful. It's interesting. I always wanted to see how Bob got the watch back to Harpo because it is done in one basically one take. When they drop all the silverware or when they drop all the stuff and they bend over to pick everything up. You could see Bob sort of taking off his watch and handing it back to Harpo. If you watch close, ah, yeah. ah, okay. So look at that. But it is—it is almost like a Groucho Harpo scene. Mm. Almost, yeah. Mm. 
Uh, the scene has a very spontaneous feeling. It feels very um, off the cuff, which doesn't hurt it at all. It's it's wonderful. And I love Harpo's attitude. I mean, it's not just the beautifully practiced physical comedy, but mm. the glare, the, the I'm better than you smile that he gives both Bob and Groucho as he keeps returning their possessions to him, to mm. them. Um, it's also great that he's stealing things just for the joy of it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Ad- Adamson says he, he gets the bet greatest pleasure from giving back what nobody knows he stole Mm -hmm. yes yes very true on stage this scene was immediately followed by a gag that we've talked about a bit in the marx brothers council group Uh, a very quick scene in which um groucho brings on six musicians who are all named manuel um they're introduced one at a time as manuel and another manuel and you two manuel and then he explains um, that these boys are Spaniards. He says, I'm just going to give this to you in prose. I'm not going to do Groucho. But as written, the line is, um, that is, they're not real Spaniards. They're fake Spaniards. They are Spaniards like the Marx Brothers. They're Spaniards, but the accent is on the last syllable. They're span Which is a remarkable <laughs> line in numerous ways. For one thing, just the use of the Yiddish term Yid, which means... Technically, it means Jew, but in, in Yiddish, it usually just means man. A lot of Yiddish jokes begin that way. A Yid was walking down the street, but it, it just means a man was walking down the street. And then name-checking themselves. Groucho actually saying the words Marx Brothers. Um, what a weird moment it must have been. Well, they were not hesitant towards dropping pop culture references, and by this point, they were part of the pop culture. Yeah. I, I wonder how how meta that felt on Broadway in 1925. You know, maybe it didn't at all, but it seems remarkable now. Mm -hmm. Um, Also an award for, for Oscar Shaw for, for being the actor who says the line Granada road, coconut road, more often than anyone else in human history (laughs) in the space of one scene, (laughs) Granada road, coconut road. (laughs) I should bring up here. Has there ever been anybody more dapper on screen than Oscar Shaw here? Jesus. No, he is Never. so well coughed for a hotel yeah. cork, especially. He, yeah, those bright yeah. white pants and what yeah. appear to be spats, <laughs> but I think they're really kind of saddle shoes. It's no wonder Polly was all over that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Bob, it's it's as though you're wearing spats, and yet you aren't. <laughs> Also, a lovely redundant line I forgot to mention in this. Uh, coming so late in the film, uh, Bob asks Harpo something, uh, and Groucho says, that's a great guy you picked to ask. <laughs> yes. So we are presented here with the conundrum of whether Harpo could talk, as at one point he whispers, he appears to whisper in the Bob's ear. Yes. Is he, is he actually whispering something and covering up with a honk? Or I think he must be, because we, we'll, we'll come to another one soon. Shortly, we will come to another. So, yeah, I think it's it, I think it's definite that he can talk in this film. Obviously, we've, we've got Hennessy or Henderson or whatever he's called saying, this one's letting on to being a dummy. Uh, we have that moment, and right. there's another one coming up. So, yeah, I think it's case closed, at least as far as this film's concerned. Oh, uh, to another question about the, the nature of Harpo, um, in case we needed any more confirmation that the character has red hair um, in the stage version. At one point, Groucho refers to Harpo as Red Grange, a football star of the 20s who had red hair. Uh, you talk for a second. I've got to feed my cat. I'll be back in 30 seconds. <laughs> That's a euphemism if ever I heard one. Uh, it's interesting here, isn't it, that it feels like we're going to get the silverware dropping routine, but we don't quite. I'm very surprised we don't. Yeah. They had obviously no particular idea that they were going to be filming animal crackers next. Yeah. I mean, stolen silverware does come out of Harpo's sleeve and is acknowledged as such, but it's not quite, it's not quite the whole production. Uh, Mm. I think it was on stage. I mean, I think on stage, they just shamelessly repeated that routine in all three Broadway shows. Okay. I'm back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now we're off to the to the party, to the big engagement party. Uh mm-hmm. Busby Berkeley eat your innovations out. We have some uh, <laughs> some aerial shots of uh geometrically arranged women. Again, uh quite a novelty for the time. 
So this was a costume party that was thrown together at the last minute in honor of the engagement? Is that <laughs> yes. what's going on? <laughs> yes. Yes, but they took the time to film a dance sequence in an innovative fashion. <laughs> At the uh, yes, at the the Ramshackle Hotel de Coconut. It is actually at the hotel, isn't it? That's where uh, the fifty cent dinner with Joe. Uh, anticipating <laughs> the later innovations of Esther Muir's husband. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes, um, Polly gets to sing again. Uh, this time on a large wicker chair of the sort, later made iconic <laughs> by Sylvia Christel in the film Emmanuel Ravelli. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And she's singing the song The Harvey this time, right? No, that's a good yes. point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she's singing, uh, yeah, the skies will all be blue when my paper's wet through. <laughs> <laughs> she looks and sounds great, but enough already with this song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and the, because the boys enter one at a time, announced just as they, just as they do in Animal Crackers, but this time at the end of the film. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. I, I wish we could see their costumes in color. Yeah. One of the few times in a Marx Brothers movie I ever think I wish this was in color, but but uh, those costumes are, are uh, eye-popping. Uh, and a wonderfully humiliating um, exchange for Zeppo on his entrance. Bob, you can, yes. you can hopefully play, play the clip here. He comes in and he says, How do you do? How do you do? Is Mr. Hammer coming? Mr. Hammer? Yes, he'll be here directly. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> should have said, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> in my notes, I have, uh, oh yeah, Zeppo is in this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the the um, fanciful names too, I mean, Harpo and Chico both get these fancy names. Zeppo doesn't even get introduced as Jamison, you know, he's just, he just walks in. Yeah. <laughs> Harpo, of course, smoking his big spliff. Not everyone um, yes. seems mm. seems keen to uh, to accept that, but I think it's fairly straightforward that, g- given the uh, the association at that time with uh, yeah. Mexicans and marijuana uh, and the size of that cigarette, that's pretty much what he's uh, yes, absolutely. what he's toking. The- <laughs> People talk as though like marijuana was discovered in the 1960s. It was definitely yes. a thing. Uh, <laughs> In yeah. the 20s and 30s. So when he's leaving the table on occasion, you, we assume that's where he's going. But I guess maybe somebody got a little nervous and said, well, well, we'll put a shot of him going over to the to the punch table. There's a quick <laughs> yeah, shot so. over him by the punch just to, just to alleviate people's fears of what's going on. It could be. But, I mean, actually, I would think alcohol was, I mean, in a way, oh, more right. taboo at the time. Oh, that's right. I forgot yeah. about that. It, it was illegal. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. Um, and there's also a... A remarkable moment, isn't it? Done without, as far as I can see, any kind of trickery, where Harpo grabs a handful of drink from a glass and yes. gets most of it in his mouth. <laughs> he does. Yeah. Oh, it's so off the cuff, too. It's just thrown yeah. <laughs> Now, you do have to admit, it is quite unusual to have a piano solo five minutes from the end of a film. Yeah. Mm. It's true. It makes me very glad that they moved the harp solo to earlier. But again, you know, it's an, another wonderful surprise that not only uh, is another of these brothers musical, not only, uh, you know, are we going to get a, a little uh, solo piece here, but also that he's got this wonderful idiosyncratic way of playing that actually, you know, gets laughs. It's so, it's so good that people actually laugh at it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think a Gypsy Love Song, this actually is a composition by Victor Herbert hmm. that Chico plays in this scene. Because I suspect he's playing it in Animal Crackers on stage, uh, so it was oh, the, yeah. most, the most recent natural thing for him for him to play. So rather than go back to the the previous one, he he played that. Yeah. In the Marx Brothers scrapbook, uh, Robert Flory talks about how he had done a film with George Gershwin, where he had shot through the piano to Gershwin, and he tried to recreate that in Coconuts using Chico, and the shot is there, very recognizable. Mm. Huh. I, I enjoy the line at when Harpo um, is w- warded off and Grouch just says, well, I got rid of one, and one like that is worth three ordinary. <laughs> yes, yeah. Some, some good lines generally. There's uh, The old yeah. girl is stewed to the eyebrows. I like a lot. I also like mm-hmm. um, when Harpo Yates says, I really don't know what to say. Well, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, when Groucho uh, introduces Margaret Dumont and he says the line, Come on, I'll give it a little bit. 
he's <laughs> quoting Texas Guinan, the queen of the New York nightclubs, who was uh, one of the most famous and beloved figures in New York in the 20s in the speakeasy scene. And give the little girl a great big hand was one of several uh, catchphrases that she popularized. Others are butter and egg man and hello, suckers. Did uh, Whoopi Goldberg play her on? on uh, the character Whoopi Goldberg played on Star Trek The Next Generation was named after Texas Guinan. Really? B- because she ran a nightclub. And huh. that, that was uh, apparently uh, Texas Guinan is kind of an icon for, for hmm. Whoopi. Yeah. Wow. Um, as as previously hinted, it is in this scene um, where during the festivities, Polly goes off to get the proof of Harvey Yates's guilt. And the reason she gets the proof of Harvey Yates's guilt is because she's tipped off by Harpo, who leans over the table and tells her. We don't hear him, but there's no other way she could have got that information. Interesting. Is we there see- a visual that confirms this? Yeah, he he he, ups- he sort of summons her. She leans over. He leans over. He whispers in her ear, and off she goes to get to get the evidence. Oh, I've never caught that. I'll do a little screenshot of the moment if I can find it. Put it on the blog. I, I certainly hope I'm not wrong now, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure that's what if happens. Not I'll Photoshop one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He t- he tells her. How about when Dumont says the wedding will go exactly as planned, but with one small change, she will be marrying Mr. Robert Adams, and the random guests burst into applause. (laughs) Oh, good, good. We wanted her to marry that other guy. Yeah, is there an audience watching this from up top? Like a gallery? Yes. What's going on here? It's like the gallery from Duck Soup that's that's looking down. That shot of them joining in when in um, I Want My Shirt – you know, Groucho says he wants his shirt. And then there's a, a shot of the gallery and the, and the uh, people upstairs saying he wants his shirt. That shot. Oh, we've um, got to talk about that. Yeah. Was never in the version I first saw. I'm willing to swear to this. If anybody listening has still got their off air recording from Channel 4 uh, in 1984, do check. And if I'm wrong, <laughs> if I'm wrong, tell me. But I'm, I'm willing to swear on a stack of Bibles that that shot was, was missing. From the version wow. that was shown. Maybe you went to the bathroom or something? <laughs> for for 0. 0.8 of a second, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that tale of the shirt, I mean, nothing like this ever happens in any other Marx Brothers film, maybe yeah. in any other film. It's so, <laughs> it's wonderful. I love it, but it's so strange. And I think if mm. it came in a later Marx Brothers movie, we would call foul and say, that's not how it works. Mm. The, the detective, the heavy character is not supposed yes. to have a delightful musical showcase. A bit, it's a bit like the guy with the paper drum at the end of Go West, you know, he just gets that. <laughs> oh, get, yeah. get, but except it isn't because it's, it's brilliantly funny. But yeah, it's hard to defend. It's hard to defend, but it's easy to accept. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and yeah, the, as I said earlier, uh, uh, this this actor, uh, Basil Rysdale, uh, was an opera singer and was in the original Broadway production. So there's at least room for the theory that maybe this was put there to show off his operatic voice. Mm. He does it beautifully. And of course, it's a parody of Carmen and was undoubtedly in his repertoire. Mm-hmm. Now, this film does end very abruptly and awkwardly uh, after the uh, crime assault, we get a short reprise of the main love song along with some uh, uh, little moments of our main characters and what's become of them. But I get the impression that this was not the original intent and it was, it was cobbled together from what they had uh, available. We get a love duet. We get uh, the, yeah. the, the, the villains uh, handcuffed. Um, and we get the Marx Brothers waving goodbye to us, which which I like. It's a nice shot. What everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I, I know um, uh, Joe Adamson and others have <laughs> expressed some um, outrage at the idea of this kind of insert, a cutaway to the Marx Brothers, um, and, and sort of giving the romantic leads the ending. It looks heavily edited. I wonder if something else was in mind originally. Yeah. In a movie that doesn't make a lot of use of cuts. There's a lot of cuts, and but I love the shot of them waving at the camera. I find it, I love that. And, and you know, a, as we see in almost all of the later films, um, it's not easy to end these things. And giving the Marx Brothers a big comic button at the end um, seems like the obvious thing, but it almost never happens. 
I've always wondered what Zeppo's reaction was after seeing the uh, preview of the film. Was he proud of his work? Was he <laughs> ashamed to show his face? In a in a in a way, this the release of this movie was, I guess, to its time, the most significant um, cutting back of of Zeppo. I mean, he was he was never really an equal brother um, on stage before this, but. You know, here he really is diminished in a way that he isn't in the stage version of Coconuts or in I'll Say She Is or previously. So he, he might have had a sinking feeling when he saw this movie. Well, I'm sure he had a bigger part uh, originally on the stage and in the original uh, cut of the film. It's just hard not to be embarrassed for him and feel bad for how little he's used. And it must have been very tough for, for them even to justify him being part of the team being built as part of the team is about 10 other characters that are more important to this film than he is. Mm. Uh, in Animal Crackers, there's the feeling that Zeppo, although he doesn't have a very big part, I think maybe, although he has one great scene in Animal Crackers, um, you know, he, he's, he's pretty much absent from that movie too. And yet there is a reason for him to be there. It makes sense for Groucho to have this assistant, um, you know, and, Often, and you kind and, of feel his absence in that. You you, you, yeah. you never quite forget that he should be there. Whereas in this one, he's he's really just got nothing to do. If he weren't a Marx brother, the character wouldn't even exist. You know, mm. there, there would be. There's no need for this employee who's kind of slightly above the other employees of, of Groucho. <laughs> you know, it, he's there because they had to put him in the movie or the mm. play, not because um, here's a character we can conveniently put Zeppo into. You know, since this was the, there wasn't a real template for Marx Brothers films yet, it might not have occurred to anyone to just put Zeppo in that romantic lead part. But if, suppose they had done Animal Crackers first and then they got into this one, they might have, they might have said, you know what, maybe we could combine the characters. Yeah. Maybe, but there was, I mean, but the, um, romantic leads on, on stage, um, you know, they were accomplished stage ingenues who were had some marquee value of their own mabel withy played polly potter mm. um you know um, she's not a, a doesn't have much currency now but i i think giving that part to one of the marx brothers would have felt like losing an opportunity to put another you know kind of star in the show but as we've talked about the animal crackers had was condensed for the screen and i think they would have done the same with coconuts had they not had it not been the first one is my point. They would they would have condensed the characters. You mean particularly like the David Van Because yeah, for some reason in my I have my notes Philip Seymour Hoffman, and I'm trying to remember why. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, I'm very curious. So what I've got William H Macy. What have you got? <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's it. That's the coconuts. Any any last thoughts on a first movie? Uh, I I love the coconuts. You know, I really do. And and although I have at times, um, you know, uh, loved it in a more qualified way, um, as I said at the top of the show, I've completely come around. And I think on the film rankings on uh, at at Marks Brothers Council Podcast dot com, um, I currently have coconuts at number three on my uh, ranking, uh, which compares with number two on Matthew's list and uh, number six on yours, Bob, at least at the time we made these lists. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. And I think at this point it's, it might be the Marx brothers movie. I'm uh, keenest to watch. Um, although in my rankings, uh, animal crackers and horse feathers are both above it. Um, coconuts, partly because of its value as a record of their, you know, stage work and the earliest example of them on film. Um, I find it now to be, if not their best movie, maybe their most interesting to me now. I, I get the most, I don't know, closeness from with them out of it. And it's just to watch them on that in this film and just imagine that if those cameras could only stay on them and keep following them after shooting these scenes, it would be following them out of the studio and into New York city, a, a place where they had just in recent years become, you know, the toast of the town um, like this in a way in this movie and in the next one, this is the Marx brothers in a, in a primal form that mm -hmm. I love them the most in. 
Amen. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, to be honest, perhaps it's the fact that I am less familiar with this than any of the other paramounts. It's not when I could recite line by line like, like the others. But uh, I did so enjoy this, uh, particularly after I was watching three times, getting ready for this podcast. I got something more out of it each time. And the things that I had issues with uh, seemed to uh, dissipate uh, into the background. Um, to be honest, I, I enjoyed this more than my last viewing of uh, Monkey Business. So I'm going to crank this one up in the ratings. I'm going to put it up to number four, right behind. Uh, I got Animal Crackers, then Duck Soup, and then Horse Feathers. I'm going to put the Coconuts as number four, just a smidge ahead of A Night at the Opera. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. The change will be made. In a lot of ways, it's amazing it came out as well as it did, with it being uh, you know, the first uh, full-length talk uh, sound musical, with it being the Marxist first film, with it being adapted from a stage show and being heavy, heavily edited. You know, it had a lot going against it. It very easily uh, could have been a disaster, but it, it wasn't. You know, it, mm. it succeeds in, in spite of its faults, and its faults are, are negligible, at least to me. An incidental thing that I noticed while refamiliarizing myself with the stage script is um, the stage version had uh, numerous little comical swipes at the state of California, which Kaufman famously detested. Um, and, you know, characters in the stage coconuts are always comparing Florida and California and saying they like Florida better. Um, and it, it reads almost as a meta commentary on, you know, we're still making New York movies here. And um, the fact that Kaufman didn't work on monkey business. Um, I, I think there are many reasons for that, but one of them was definitely that he always wanted to be, as he said, 10 minutes from times square. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I just remembered my Philip Seymour Hoffman bit. Uh, it's pretty simple. Basically, I just want to say that <laughs> when you see a performer or an act for the first time, very often the impression is just so powerful that no matter what they do for the rest of their career, is that you always think of them in that initial role, in that first time you saw them. Philip Seymour Hoffman, the first time I saw him was in uh, Scent of the Woman. It wasn't the leading role, but it was very powerful. And no matter what he did the rest of his career, whenever I thought of Philip Seymour Hoffman, I thought of, oh, yeah, the guy from Scent of a Woman. So that's why it's not unusual that for first-generation Marx fans, people who are around during that era, they never really topped the coconuts. So that's about it. (laughs) (laughs) And so that brings us to the end of another podcast. Thanks for joining us. Please stay with us through 2020. And if by any chance you didn't find any of mine or Noah's books under your tree this Christmas, remember next year, get a better tree. It's a new year. It's our first podcast of 2020. And although the Marx Brothers Council has a very wise policy of avoiding talk of anything divisive, um, in the United States, 2020 is a big year for what we all know to be a, an obvious reason. Matthew Conium is coming to New York. Huh. Is a stowaway? <laughs> I'm coming over in a barrel. But I am bringing the wife and kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you don't swing a cat in there, you should be fine. <laughs> and we will have more to say about that very soon. Yeah, we will have more on that. And I'm uh, so grateful that we were able to get this podcast done in time, just in time for Coconuts' uh, 91st <laughs> anniversary. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Just just scraped under the wire. <laughs> yeah. This movie is 91 years old now. Wow. All that remains to be said is that the Marx Brothers Council podcast is produced and co-hosted by Bob Gasell, Noah Diamond, and yours truly, Matthew Conium. It's edited by Bob Gasell, and it promises to be out of your guest bedroom by the end of next week. We'll be back soon with more merriment, more fun, more controversy, and lots more nitpicking over inconsequential trivia. If that's your idea of a good time, please do like us, review us favorably, and generally spread the word on social media. So, until we meet again, it's time for our final song. Some of you have been suggesting that even though we introduce the songs each time with slick professional confidence, the reason we don't actually name them in our intros is because we don't really have the first clue as to what they're going to be until Bob presents us with the final edit. Well, that may have been true in the past, but I can assure you that I know exactly what it's going to be this time. It's this. So here it is. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> to mention forgot to mention in this beautiful blu-ray restoration i had never noticed before the opening of the film you have this universal logo and color i mean <laughs> i had never seen that before well, those guys did a great job restoring the opening of the film it was, it's it was absolutely beautiful looks like cgi almost 